Good Wednesday morning. This is interesting. This is chapter 2 of Genesis. It's a second creation to come. It's interesting. The writing style changes. It's, there's probably two traditions that the ultimate uh, writer put together. But it's interesting. He said, the time when the God made the earth and the heavens, while as yet there was no field shrub on earth and no grass of the field that had sprouted, for the Lord God had sent no rain upon the earth. There was no man to till the soil. You could think of the farmer there, you see. But a stream was welling up out of the earth, and it was watering all the surface of the ground. The Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and so man became a living being. See, this is the creation of man, a second version of it, you see. But this is very interesting. Watch what he said, didn't he? This is the introduction in chapter two of a moral universe, not just a naturally beautiful universe, but a moral universe. Watch, watch how he does it. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there, and he placed there the man whom he had formed. No mention of Eve, notice that. Out of the ground, the Lord God made various trees grow, and they were, and that were delightful to look at and good for food, with the tree of life in the middle of the garden the tree of knowledge of good and evil. See, the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, it comes from the, you know, see, when he means life there, the tree of life, it's got to mean more than just physical life. Then God, the Lord God, took, uh, then took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. Cultivating care for it. Didn't use the word dominion. Okay. The Lord gave man this order. You are free to eat from any of the trees of the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For from that tree you shall not eat. The moment you eat from it, you are surely doomed to die. The tree of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil. You should enter, you're going to enter into it. This is a moral universe. Because now... The human, the man, the man, ha he knows this much. Even though it's the tree of good and evil, he knows already, he, he already knows obedience, to choose to follow God's will or not. So he's already a moral agent. He already is, or what's the point of telling him not to eat, eat from that tree? See, that's tricky stuff. He's already, already a moral agent just by his intelligence and his freedom. Or God wouldn't say to him, don't eat from the tree. Why? It's, it's not, it, it, and if you do, there's a consequence to it. That's rational animal. It's a rational being who is free. So God creates us. God creates humankind out of the earth. That's an evolutionary theory. Think about this thing. It was probably written 4,000 years before the time of Christ, okay? For, for us, 4,000 years ago. 2,000 years before the time of Christ. you got an evolutionary theory, but we evolve as moral animals. And there are massive consequences to our choices. Life and death. See? But what kind of death? Physical death? That's automatic. Physical death is, a, is intrinsic to the very nature of biological universe. We come out of the clay. See? From, death, from dust we emerge, and to dust we shall return. See? That's, the, that's just as natural as it can be. There's nothing. It has to be talking about moral death. If you do, if you, do you are cutting yourself off from, from life, the fullness of life. In the end, it's communion with God. By evil, if you eat of the fruit, if you break, if you do violence to the law of God, you will separate yourself from God, the source of life itself. And so you will die. Death does not simply mean biological death. It means isolation. I'm, I'm, so you'll see that Adam and Eve will be banned from the garden. And they they don't look at it. Michelangelo's version of that is powerful. They don't look at each other as they're kicked out of the garden. And alienation is a form of death. It's the worst form of death. It's a radical separation and loneliness. You see that? That's the truth. You see? We are lonely animals, see? And I think the Genesis account is trying to understand how did this happen? How did, if we were created 
morally good? How did, how did it come that we are so isolated as human beings from each other? Why do we suffer so much? And I think the answer is we are sinful. We are sinful insofar as we reject the author of life. Boy, is that simplified, but I think that's right. See, we are free to choose. We're free to choose who and what who and what we will be. And in the light of the gospel, in the light of the God, and the, the, you know, the readings of the, the, the biblical tradition and the life of the church, we're told what it is to live. And to live is to live a deep and profound moral and spiritual life in communion. That's the church, in communion with each other. We are lonely animals called to communion. Put it that way. I'm not doing a good job at all this morning. It's five o'clock. <laughs> you see here, the thing just chimed. I'm not doing well, and I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm, I feel like I'm wasting your time. Another way, maybe I'm not. I, I see the book of Genesis as a story of how do we get to such radical loneliness. See? How? Because we chose to eat of that tree, the tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil. We chose, we chose to go against the will of God, see? our vanities. And that isolates us, not just from God, but from most of all, from each other. God is a very tender and patient father, as it were, seeking his children to be united again. But we have a deep resistance. It's where the doctrine of original sin comes from. Even if there was no biblical story about original sin, you'd have to come up with something, because how do you account for human estrangement, human alienation? We would have to come up with some theory of human alienation because it seems even from a point of view, look at how children are rivals. How, even little children I often possess it. Antagonistic, whatever the words are. We are restless animals and lonely animals. And that's the truth. And yet we are capable of intimacy and love. And you see that. You see it in friendship, you see it in love, you see it in marriage, you see it in families, but you see it isn't easy either. It's no walk in the park, it's no walking in Garden of Eden. We are kicked out of that garden, as it were. And that is, in other words, we live in a hostile world. And we overcome that world, as it were, through the intimacy of love and self-sacrifice. And that's the quintessential example of Christ in the cross, the Good Friday, that it is, Paradoxically, through self-sacrifice, do we really discover ourselves? Because in it, we discover our ability, ourselves as loving people and loved, beloved and loved. But you don't get it out from looking out for your own self-interest. If you choose to be self-interested, you're going to know good and evil because you're going to be the author of the evil of your own lives. It's not something so sad when you see how the vice of selfishness can consume a person in such a manner that in the end, that person has no friends. I think of this as a, I remember at a funeral once, somebody said of another person, there are no tears. I think what a horrible way, what a horrible description, meaning this person had no friends. Why? And then he explained why. The person was mean. Okay, be mean, but you'll die alone. See? That's sad. That's the that's Genesis in a way. See? We're called, we're called to good in we're called to freedom and love. And Christ is the quintessential example of it. But if you choose yourself, then you get yourself. You get what you chose, you'll die alone. You'll live and die alone. But if you love generously, tenderly, then you'll have the communion of life. You will not be alone. You will not be lonely. You will flourish. And that's the truth. The biggest challenge of all of life is to overcome one's self selfishness. That's simply true. The egocentrism of selfishness and to be willing to sacrifice oneself for the beloved. And then you end up with yourself fully in communion with the beloved. That's true. I'm not a sentimentalist. I'm not at all, actually. I'm an Italian realist. I know what love is, but I also know love's failures. 
I know what it is to fail. It's all around.